Hello and welcome to another tutorial. So this is the third part of the series on building the hybrid GOP system, the goal-oriented action planning. So similar to the earlier videos, uh, there will be three links that you will find in the description. The first is a link to the code as it was uh, at the beginning of this uh, sort of tutorial. So if you're wanting to just start from exactly the same point as I am, that will be one of the links that you can access there. There is also a link to the code as it will be at the end of the tutorial, and there will be a link to the completed package. So with this series, it is quite a lengthy series. Uh, we'll see how many it ends up actually being, but at this point, it kind of feels like it's going to be somewhere between six to eight uh, tutorial videos. And I understand that that is a pretty lengthy series, and it's also something where, uh, quite understandably, there might be parts of it that you are just not interested in seeing being built, and that's completely fine. Um, I will be releasing the series in a new part each week, so there won't be a large period to wait if you're watching this sort of in real time when it's coming out. Uh, if you're watching it a bunch later, then the good news is the next part will already be there. So if there's specific parts that you're interested in, you might want to skip ahead to those. Uh, there will also, as I have in all of the videos, there will be a set of time codes uh, in the description for different points in this video. Uh, and I am going to look at doing a, basically a too long didn't read uh, version of this, just diving directly into the package, giving a bit of an overview there for it. Uh, if people just want to have something that's a, a shorter version to sort of orient themselves with it. So these, the full series is more if you're wanting to really understand how it's been assembled, and if you're wanting to understand the philosophy behind it, that's really going to be a lot of what I'll be talking about in each of these videos. So this video, we're going to be looking at starting to build some of the core components for the actual GOAP system, so for the goals and the actions. Uh, now, so we'll be focusing on the goals and the actions, getting the basic uh, underlying infrastructure set up for those. I won't implement the actual planner in this particular tutorial. Uh, that was something where I was originally going to include the planner directly in this, but I think the planner is actually going to be its own standalone tutorial. And the reason for that is I had forgotten just how much is actually there in the planner, and it is several hundred lines of code as it currently stands, uh, which is quite a lot. Uh, and if I tried to cover it in this video, then I would potentially be doing this video for a few hours, uh, and that's a very, very long length of time. So I'm going to focus on the goals and the actions. Now this does actually replicate the process of how I built this. So this, uh, in terms of sort of my planning of how I approach this, this was a lot of experimentation and iteration with this. Uh, and I did actually build it from, like I built the state machine system, but then I built from the actions up. So the actions and then the goals. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to build from use cases and build directly from those use cases. So when I was implementing the brain, that actually, so the planner side I refer to as the brain, when I was implementing that, I wanted to have concrete use cases that I needed to fit in with. Uh, so that's the reason why it's been structured like that, and why when I'm presenting it, I'm going through in that order. Uh, so let's dive on in. So as with all the other ones, uh, you will see me referring to the uh, version of this uh, that I implement. I am making changes along the way, so, you know, as sort of a bit of a, a reference there, I do actually make changes and modifications along the way, because there are things that in the moment I spot where it's a case of, actually, I can do this a little bit better, uh, and I go and make modifications. So we're going to have our hybrid GOP section. Now, similar to what I've done with all the other ones, I will create an assembly definition for this. Hybrid GOP. And we will set a root namespace. And I need to bring in my common core 
and I also need to bring in uh, my state machine system. So, okay, that's sort of the starting structure for this. We're going to have our scripts folder. So with the GOAP system, one of the key sort of design pillars I've tried to follow with this uh, has been one of it being modular and it being easy to add in different behaviors, things like of that. That's been a kind of a, a strong fundamental goal for this. So for that reason, I'm going to start to set up a couple of things here. So one, the brain itself is going to be defined by an interface. Uh, again, that is because the brain, I'm implementing a version of it, but I want to leave the possibility there for other people implementing a br the brains in a different way. I'm going to create a folder for actions, and I'm going to create a folder for goals. So similarly, under the goals, there will be a script that will be a gope goal. And then I'll also have, uh, like I've done with the other sort of ones, I'll have, and this one ended up being an abstract class, a gope goal base. And then in the actions, we're going to have a similar structure where we'll have a gope action. Then the base one will hold a lot of infrastructure. So there will be a gope action base. But then I will also, and that would be the abstract class, I will then also specifically have one that is a gope action, and this is going to be an FSM one. So the idea is, is I will create all of the set of actions uh, using that action FSM one. But if I wanted to support something else, like for example, an action being a behavior tree, then I might later on have a go back action BT. Uh, and that actually is a thing that I do want to do as a later stage. Uh, that won't be part of this initial series, but there is a lot of things that I want to do later on with this series, uh, making it a bit more modular for some areas where it isn't, and also adding in support for behavior trees. So the intent is that this project and this package is going to be the area that I'll do sort of pretty much the majority of any AI iteration on and that then things like the Sims and RTS projects will get updated based upon this. So that's kind of a, a fundamental goal for it. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to add in here is there's going to be a bunch of, with the GOPE, some commonly defined things. Uh, and so I want to actually have a script here that I'm just going to call common. And we'll get to setting up these as we sort of progress. So the common one, I'm going to work with this for at the start. So once it's loaded. So one of the key things with the setup I was going for is that I wanted to have it that the actions require resources and that for an action to be active, it needs to be essentially locking a particular set of resources. So I'm actually going to define that here. Uh, so this is a good place for defining it in the common script. So I'm going to, because of how this will work, I want to make this an enum where I've given it the flags attribute that changes a little bit how I work with it. Uh, we specifically use that flags attribute when, and you'll see when I actually set the values for the elements in this. So none is going to be 0x00, so we're specifying things using hexadecimal, because each one is going to be only setting an individual bit. And then we have head. 
So that's all I'm going to define in terms of resources for now. This is something where you could, you know, I've tried to make sure we've got a lot of other bits free there. You could easily go and uh, set up your own particular ones for, you know, your uh, characters. So if you have multiple sets of legs, you might want to have different resources, you know, based upon the that. You might want to split out the arms from the torso. There's different things you could be doing there. Uh, I'm also going to have an all entry, which I'm going to just say is 0ff. So this gives us eight possible resources. If we needed more, we would just extend all. So we've got a pretty large range that we could accommodate with this. Now one of the things that I'm going to set up now, because I know that I'm going to need it later, uh, and this isn't something that I came up with the implementation myself, I'll include uh, the specific credit for it. Uh, so what this is, is it's going to be a really handy thing for me to be able to know how many resources something is using. So I essentially need to be able to count the bits. And that's something where there are a variety of different ways of actually doing this. And I am just going to actually paste this in because this isn't code, this is code that I slightly modified myself, uh, but I've got the original uh, credit in here. Uh, so this came from Stack Overflow. I've put the direct link here for that. I do recommend going and taking a look at that. Uh, it's got some really good discussions around different methods for counting the bits. Uh, this is actually a really cool method and I re really quite like how it works. So what it's going through and doing is it's each time we see while the value is not zero. So while it's anything other than zero, it's going to go through and it increments the bit count and then it ends it with the value minus one. So it's going to mask out uh, the, some of the bits and that will keep going until value will eventually always be zero. So really cool way of counting the bits and also quite efficient because it means as soon as nothing is set, so if we had, you know, just torso set, then it would go through and effectively be, as soon as it's found that, oh, yep, torso set, I've cleared that, now it's just zero. Cool, I've counted the number of bits, so it early outs. So it's a really cool setup, I quite like it. Uh, the other thing I'm going to set up is our goals are going to have priorities. So with this, I... Could have gone for an enum with this, but I feel like having actually statically defined values fits better than an enum. Uh, it just makes it a little bit easier to do maths on them without doing any casts. And I think that is sort of my, it worked just a lot cleaner and neater than when I've tried sort of enum based approaches. So, we're going to say that the priority is always defined using an integer. We'll have a maximum of 100. We will have a minimum of zero. And then we'll have an additional one here that allows us to indicate that it should not be run. So do not run. And I'm going to make that int and if I do min value, so that's good. And then I can set up intermediate ones between here. So I can have const int critical. And what I'm going to do is just do a bunch of copying and pasting. I've already worked out the different ones that I'll have. So I have high, medium, low and this idea of an ambient priority. So critical, we're going to say that critical begins at 90. This is just to give us a sort of you know rough benchmark of where we can be placing values because uh, we do want to have some goals that the priority is fixed and some that the goal priority is dynamic. Oops, 50. 
have 25 and 10. So this gives us a pretty good range. Uh, one of the things that you want to watch for with the priorities is it's really easy to get out of control with it. And part of the reason I'm using integers rather than floats is so that I'm not having to deal with like marginal small differences between ones. Uh, because this is a common area, we might have names that we're wanting to define, which just in case we do, I will have a static class names. Now we don't have anything currently in there, but we might have ones that we do add in there later on. So, okay, that's good. We've got our common setup going. Now our brain, we're not going to do anything sort of too much in it yet. I'm going to just put in a couple of little basics. Uh, now it, this, because it's an interface, uh, we will say that it has to be a debuggable object. So that's where it's not going to have initially a common core. But we do that, brings it in. Uh, so that's good. We've said that it implements that. And we'll only for now create a single method. This will just make it easy for other things to uh, access stuff if they need to. Uh, so we'll have a easy way of being able to access the blackboard. Uh, so shall I call it current blackboard. That. So that's good. So, okay, we've got that set up, not too much to it. Let's start to look at, and I will go for the actions first. So first thing we're going to do is our interface for this. So it will be implementing idebuggable, not the idebuggable object, but just idebuggable. So idebuggable object, uh, is for sort of top level ones like this, whereas idebuggable is for components of those top level ones. That's also an interface, and that is good. So, okay, what are some things that our action is going to have? Well, one of the things is that it's going to need to have control over what resources are required. So, we're going to have character resources and resources required. That, that's something that will need to be implemented. Uh, it's going to need to be able to be linked to a brain. So bind to brain. And this is why we have the brain interface already set up it's going to need to be able to be asked if it can satisfy a particular goal. So that's another core function. So can satisfy, and this will take in a go goal. Now, intentionally, none of this stuff is specific to it being monolithic gope. Uh, the idea and how I'm sort of structuring this is so that in theory, you could pretty easily adapt this to work for microlithic. Uh, that's really a, an important thing with this. Now, I'm going to have the cost retrieval. Now, this is something where I did consider making this a property. The reason I went for making it a function is I try to stick with properties being something where the value is not continually changing, uh, or at least is not potentially an expensive calculation because otherwise it can be a little deceptive and you can use a property thinking that it's going to be a cheap operation, but it actually ends up being super expensive. Uh, whereas when it's a function, there's not necessarily an expectation that it's going to be a cheap function. Uh, I might actually change that on that basis as well to calculate cost. Uh, so that makes it a little bit more explicit that there is actually logic happening here. Then we're going to have things like our start, continue, and stop behaviors. So we'll have our start action, and we'll have 
continue action. We'll have stop. And then we will also have tick action. Now, there is a slight inconsistency here relative to the state machine. And so probably what I'll do is actually go back and update the state machine to match this process. Uh, then we have our delta time like that. So that looks pretty good for our action. I'm going to, while I'm at it, because we're starting to have a little bit of interaction with the goals, I will open up the goal as well. And its interface is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot to it. So this also has to implement iDebuggable. And there's also an interface like that. Our goal is also going to have a bind to brain function, unsurprisingly. And that's going to take in the brain. Now this one is going to, for the priority, priority is something that, now I did say before, like I was trying to avoid properties for things that are going to have calculations involved. And the priority, I actually am fine with there being a calculation, but there'll actually be an explicit step to do that. So there is going to be this prepare for planning function. And the idea is, is that prepare for planning will be the signal to the goals of, okay, are there calculations you need to run? If so, do that. I'm going to also have a is valid. Now, because this is a property, this is one case where I'm going to break the convention that I've normally followed uh, of prefixing the bool with a b. Uh, because of just how it's actually working here. So something will be considered valid if the priority is greater than or equal to our goal priority minimum and it is less than the maximum. That's going to be required for it being considered valid. So I will just bring this down like that. So that's good. So the idea is prepare for planning, we'll populate priority, and then we've got just a really easy, quick little check uh, for if something is valid or not. So the other things that it's going to have, similar to what I did with the actions here, where I had uh, start, continue, stop, I'm going to have start goal. Uh, now intentionally, I'm not just calling it start, when I was doing the initial development of this, I did have it called star. Uh, and unsurprisingly, because in the end, the goals and, and actions end up being mono behaviors, uh, it was causing some very weird bugs. So I had to go and rename things. So I'm making sure that I don't do that this time. Now, so that's what the interface looks like for our goal. Pretty straightforward, pretty clean sort of interface. That's kind of the really the intent with it. And the actual goal doesn't really need to do a lot. So if I go to the base here for a goal, uh, so this is going to be abstract. That's very intentional. I do still want it to be a mono behavior. It's going to be something you attach on. Now, later on, I do want to be more data driving these uh, and have them not be something where it's a mono behavior you have to attach and have a nicer interface for it. But for now, it's going to be a mono behavior uh, and it implements igope goal. I will get rid of start and update for now because although it's a mono behavior, it is going to be very much externally driven. So, okay, there's going to be a few things that we need to set up. I'm going to let it do a lot of the work for me for implementing the interface. Uh, so the priority, well, with priority, I want to do a bunch of different things. For that, there's going to be a lot of little bits and pieces we need to set up. For one thing, I want to cache the brain that we're actually talking to, and I want to cache the blackboard. So I'm going to have a protected... Uh, and I'll have a gope brain 
and this is going to be the linked brain. Now, if we remember, uh, that's all set up like that. We also are going to be caching the blackboard because that's something we might want to have access to as well. So buying to brain doesn't really need to do a lot. Uh, we will have protected by goat. Whoops, uh, no, let's say protected blackboard, last name, linked blackboard. And that's just going to be going linked blackboard is our in brain and the current blackboard. So I, you know, technically I could set up so it doesn't need to be doing that. So I could do something uh, instead like this, where it goes linked brain dot current blackboard. That would give me the same result. Uh, so I'll do that for now. So that's good. So, okay. In terms of what these different things need to do, I'm going to move some of these things around a little bit uh, just so we can get them set up the way that we're after because uh, the interface thing doesn't always put things in the same order which is actually really annoying when it implements the interfaces it puts it in alphabetical order and alphabetical order is not always what you want I actually would prefer it follows just the order of things in the interface because uh, that would make a little bit more sense uh, but it doesn't do that which is annoying. So, okay, let's look at what these things actually need to do. I want to have functions that it will be optional because for the goal, not all of these things need to be overridden. So I'm going to have some optional things uh, of a protected virtual void on start. And this will be our on start goal. Like that. We're going to have similar ones for on continue and our on stop. And also for our on tick. So like that. Uh, and that takes in the delta time. So for most of these ones here, all that these will do is run the respective function. So the idea is I'm not making the ones that they're calling abstract because there's not necessarily something where I need to always force a goal to have it do the logic. So I'm making it that it's possible for things to override it, but not mandatory. Uh, because for a goal in particular, there's often not a lot of reason for it. I'm really just trying to keep a level of sort of flexibility there as the goal. Now, prepare for planning on the other hand though. That, I do want to force things to have to actually implement that. So what I will do is I'm going to mark that as abstract and do that. So this will force child classes to have to implement to prepare for planning. So that's very intentional. Uh, with the goals, I also, when I bind to the brain, then I want to do an initial preparing for the planning. So I want to actually have that get run uh, at that particular point. So I'll do a prepare for planning like that. Now, this is something where I might want to make it possible for people to do some custom initialization. So I'm going to have a protected virtual void on initialize. And again, this wouldn't be something where it's mandatory that you have to implement it, but it gives people the option. So the idea being I can link the brain do an on initialize and then do prepare for planning. So if you're implementing a goal based on this, then you can reliably assume that when you are planning, 
that you will have had an opportunity to do any initialization, and that when you're doing that initialization, a brain has already been linked to it. So it means that it, it gives you some certainty in terms of the flow for things. And I think that's really important. Uh, so then the final thing really for the goal base is actually setting up our debugger handling. So if this is the selected goal, then I'm going to add in a section header and I'm specifically going to make it that it is in bold and we'll have our debug display name and so that's going to intentionally let us know that uh, it's the active selected goal. Uh, otherwise, all it's going to do is just output it normally. Now, the other thing I will include here though, is I'm going to include the priority because that would actually be really handy to have displayed. So if it's selected, it will include that. If it's not selected, it will not be in bold. So it'll just make it that we can really easily tell at a glance what's actually happening. And similar to what we've done with other ones, uh, we are going to have a very similar function that will again be one of these optional ones for overriding. So we'll have a protected virtual void and get rid of our extra void. This will be the gather debug data internal. And we'll do exactly the same as what we did with all of these. Just have it really minimal uh, in the actual sort of setup there for it. So there's nothing we need to override here, but if we did, we'd, we, we've got the option for actually doing that. And I'll just run a gather debug data internal, provide our inputs. So that's it for the base part of our goal. It's got the interfaces we need for being able to start it, initialize it, link everything together. Uh, so the goal side of things there is good. Don't need to do anything further with that. Uh, there will potentially be other sort of helper little things that we add in that we will get to, but now let's take a look at the action side of things, because that's one where we haven't, you know, we've implemented the interface here. We haven't implemented this side of it, of that actual base action. So we're going to get that up and running next. So again, this is one that for now is based off of mono behavior. Uh, it will be abstract and it will implement igope action. So again, we remove these functions. Now, again with this, there is going to be a bunch of sort of standard helper stuff we set up. So we'll let it implement all of the interfaces like of that. And then we're going to go and start to modify this uh, for how we need it to work. So similar to a lot of stuff with the goal, there's going to be a lot of overlap with the basic things that this is going to be doing. So if we take a look at the things that we had here for our base goal, uh, we had stuff like our brain and the action. So we're going to bring that over to our action base because we want exactly that. So when we bind to the brain, then what we're going to do is linked brain is equal to that. So that's good. So now we've got the things like the uh, debug display name and the resources required. So the debug display name, that's a fairly straightforward one in terms of what we'll do for that. So the get, just is going to correspond to, we do a get type and grab the name like that. So that's good. Now for the resources required, uh, this is something we're gonna do a similar sort of thing, but we wanna be able to modify this in our child classes. 
So what I could do is I could force children to have to calculate this. And one way that I could easily do that is I could go and say, well, okay, I get, and that's going to be equal to, well, going to be assigned to, uh, and get required resources. So this can be a function that I must implement in the children. And this is a case where I want to ensure that that function has to be implemented. Uh, so what I would do, that's a case where the best option is going to be to have a, not public, but a protected abstract and our e character resources get required resources. So we want to force that to have to be implemented. Uh, and so there is a little bit of a cost happening there, but it should be a very fast function. It just saves having to you know, manually do stuff. Now I could, as an alternative, I could call that function from bind to brain. It's not going to make a huge difference. It's something that I might find, you know, I'll do a little bit of stress testing on and I might change at a later point. But for now, we've got the interface. It wouldn't eliminate that function. It would just change when it gets called. Uh, but this is something where just in case we might want to change uh, the, you know, resources we use at different stages, gives us that option, that flexibility to actually do that. So, okay can satisfy and things like of that. We've got a bunch of things we'll need to set up for it. But the big thing that I want to be able to be doing is I want to uh, set up what sort of goals and things like of that I actually support. So what I'm going to do is have here a protected, and this is going to be a system.type array that contains supported goal types and it is going to be empty initially. So it's going to be completely empty and then when we bind to the brain or well, we've cached the brain I'm going to have a populate supported goal types So that's going to be an abstract function. I will also have, much like we did with the action, it will be an on initialize. So the populate supported goal types, that is one that I want to mandate has to be actually implemented. So this is going to be another one that comes down here and we have a protected abstract void or populate the goal types. So that has to be actually set up. Uh, for the on initialize, I'm going to do the same. So this is something where I want to force actions to have to consider what initialization stuff they might want to actually do. And then similar to what I did with the goal where I had these abstract ones for starting, continuing, stopping, ticking. I'm going to do the exact same thing of having these virtual versions of it uh, that get overridden. So what I would do is in the action place here is these ones I'm going to, whereas for the goal I made these virtual, for the action I want to force that these have to be implemented. And there's a specific reasons for this. And the main one is that with the actions, there is stuff that I know it is important happens in these. And I want, when you are writing an action, to have to think about, okay, what do I want to be doing when it starts running, when it's continuing, when we interrupt it, things like of that. So that's the reason why I'm making these abstract, because I think it's very important uh, that there is proper consideration given to what you're actually doing with them. So we'll have our on tick, 
have our on stop. On start. Uh, we will move the continue down because again, it has done it in the order that I'm not a fan of. We'll have to look and see if there's a way to change that because I would much prefer it matches the order of things in the interface. But I do understand with how it's likely working with reflection that it maybe can't easily do that. Uh, so yeah, it may not be such a straightforward thing for it to actually do. So okay, so far so good. Calculate cost. Well, that's actually one that in the base one, I don't want to have to provide an implementation for it. I'm going to make that abstract, which means with that being abstract, I'm going to come down here uh, and alongside where I actually had stuff like of this. So I think that fits well with those. I might actually bring those further up. Not that it's going to matter when you use the automated thing for implementing it and it just puts them in alphabetical order, but still. Uh, so, okay, so far so good. In our binding of the brain, we'll guarantee that the brain is linked, which means we'll have access to the blackboard. We will be able to populate the goal types we'll be able to initialize it. And we know that when we initialize that things like the brain and the goal types have been all set up. So that's good. So for the can satisfy, well, what we can do here is we check. So for each var, and we have goal type in our supported goal types. Now the default is going to be to return false because by default, nothing should be supported. And then we're just going to check, well, f in goal, get type is equal to that goal type. Then we just return true. So very little needed for actually matching that. So quite straightforward. So we've got a lot of the bits that we actually need for this all set up. Our gather debug data is the final bit here to implement in our base action. So this, I'm only going to output stuff if the action, if this thing is selected. So otherwise it's just gonna return. Now, if it's selected, then I want to add in a section header. And what I'm going to do is that's going to include the display name. And then I want to also include the resources being used. So the resources required. Uh, so that'll appear, that actually will format that quite nicely, which is handy. Uh, so that's good. And we can just close that off like that. Can always tweak the formatting if we need. Uh, and as with all of the other ones that we've done, we have our internal one like this. So we will have down here that, and we'll just automatically then always call that. So going for this sort of structure really makes it easy to control how things are appearing. It allows us to take away some of the stuff that a user needs to set up to make things up and running uh, and still giving flexibility. So I'm trying to strike that balance of taking away a lot of the you know busy work, but also giving you know, the flexibility, the capability to actually do things in sort of a handy way. So, so far that's good, no errors. So then we get to our FSM action. So this is actually uh, the first one where we're gonna have, you know, it's sort of starting to link to things like the state machine. Uh, so that's sort of a big aspect for this one. 
Uh, and there's not really, you know, a horrifying amount to this. There's a little bit of stuff that it needs to do, but it's not too bad. So this is still going to be an abstract class. So it's still an abstract one, and it comes from a gop action base. We get rid of start and update. So that's good. We've got that. Now, what I would do is there's going to be some functions here that I intentionally want to override. So I'm going to override the on initialize. And I will, even though the base doesn't really do anything. So I'm overriding on initialize. I want to override a couple of other ones. So our on start action is an important one. We want to also override things like our continue because we don't want the children to have to actually implement that. Uh, we're going to bring in the stop action one, uh, and we'll do the same thing for overriding tick. So we'll have uh, protected override and our on tick action. So we've got a bunch of ones there set up to start implementing. So, okay, this is going to need to have our actual state machine. So we're going to have a protected and we'll have our SM instance. And this will be our linked state machine. And we will new that. Now, I want to also set up a couple of handy states. So I want to set up some simple states for having completed the action uh, and having completed with it being, you know, sort of succeeded or failed. Uh, now, these are ones that I could use the existing system funk stuff that I already set up support for, but I want these to be even more minimal than that. Uh, so I will actually set up here a class, and this is an internal state, and this is going to be for action completed. Or maybe actually a better name would be uh, state machine. Actually, no. I think, yeah, state machine finished. So that's going to be based off of our state base. Uh, that does mean there's going to be a bunch of things it needs to implement, uh, which is fine. There's not going to be a lot of logic that these actually need. The idea behind this is this is just going to be really sort of a, a helper to actually make it easy for being able to, you know, let the action know that the state machine has entered a particular state. So what I'm going to do is this will have a system.action and that system action won't take anything. Uh, this will be our finish. Actually, I'll just call this the callback function. It's actually probably the best name for it. Then this is going to have a constructor. So this is all internal. Actually, it doesn't need to be that. Uh, we'll have our internal. Like that. Do you know that can be flagged as internal? Uh, we'll take in a system.action in callback function. Now with this one, I'm not going to run the base at a state population uh, will not provide support for overriding the name. Uh, this is just going to be a one where what I will do is have this just actually provide null to it. So it'll still call that base one, but explicitly with null. Uh, and then I just set the callback function to the one that's been passed in. So when we enter, well, what I will do is I will call that. 
So we have our callback function. We just run it. And then we immediately return that we have finished. In exit internal, there's nothing we need to do. Uh, and in tick eternal, we again, all we need to do is just return finished. So nothing that we want to do in that. So this just makes it easy for us having a couple of sort of states that can provide sort of a little bit of communication out of the state machine. Uh, so that looks good. So what I will then do is on our on initialize, I'm going to set up here a keep this as protected because I think that's useful because uh, child states might want to refer to this and we'll have a internal state or failed. Uh, and that will be a get and a private set. We don't want anything else accessing it. And we'll have another one that is internal state finished. Same sort of logic there. So that's good. So we'll create those two ones. So we'll have our internal state failed is a new and it's going to be a new one of our internal state for state machine finished and we'll have that we're going to set up and i'll put them here i think uh, we'll have a couple of functions for hooking that the state machine has completed so i have a protected void on state machine completed. Now this is something where we could make it that this can be overridden via the child classes. If I was going to do that, what I would do is do it something like of this instead. So on state machine completed, and I'll change that actually to uh, state machine completed failed and then we also have a finished so this is what uh, these two ones will actually bind to so the finished one will get that and the failed one unsurprisingly, we'll get the failed function. So we've got those set up. So that's good. So we've got some hooks coming out of the state machine for uh, if it's succeeded and failed. And these are the idea is, is that actions that are based off of this uh, have some handy ones that they can actually just refer to. Uh, so it keeps it a little bit easier. Uh, and I might mark these as internal and change the naming there. That then makes it easy for me to take these and come down here and get rid of the internal, for both of these and we make these protected virtual ones like that. This will just allow, if a child one wants to override it, it can, uh, but while the child ones can override it, we still have an entry point where if there's additional logic we need to do, uh, that we can actually do that. So I think that's a structure that's kind of important, gives us flexibility in the future. So try to always with uh, making use of interfaces and abstract classes, keep that sort of uh, flexibility there to what we're actually doing. So that's good. We've got those basic states set up. Now I want to, you know, our state machine 
it's going to be useful for it to be able to be linked to a blackboard. So I want to be able to go, hey, our linked state machine bind to a blackboard and we want to be able to, because we know on initialize, our blackboard has already been set up. So I can actually get our blackboard. So that's handy. Now, what I can then do is I want to force any child classes to configure their state machine. So this is where I would have an abstract function. So that actually can go back to being protected. So we will have a protected abstract void or configure FSM, because I want to force any of the uh, child functions to have to actually set this up. That's really important. Now, our start action. Well, start action, I want to reset the state machine. And here, this is something where child ones could override this and substitute in stuff. Uh, but I don't think there's a particular need for them to do that. Now, it could be useful for the child ones to also know when we have reset the state machine. So that's something where I'm going to have here a protected virtual void on state machine reset. Now, it's not one that I want to make abstract because they might not need to override it. There might be cases where it would be useful, but not in all cases. So what I want to do is we perform the reset and then we'll let the action know that that reset has happened. Uh, in terms of the on continue action, it's actually nothing we need to do in that. The reason I'm overriding it is just so that child classes don't get yelled at about it because everything is handled via the states. So it actually kind of makes sense for the continue not to be getting handled uh, by anything based off of the FSM one. Now stop on the other hand, well stop, we're going to reset the state machine when that happens and we'll run the reset and I'll change the order of those around. So that's all we need to do for the stop. Uh, what I will also do is then we've got our tick. So tick, pretty straightforward. Link state machine, tick, and our delta time. So that's good. So, okay, we've largely got all of the bits there uh, that we want it to actually be doing. Now we do have our setups here for if it failed, things like of that. So that's actually something where what I would do when it failed, we've got kind of different options of what we could do with it, but because actions might be continually running, I think an appropriate sort of default behavior is actually going to be to reset the state machine. So the same stuff we would do here, I'm actually going to put in here like that. So we're giving the user a lot of hooks if they want them, uh, but they're not forced to actually have to use them. So, okay, that's looking pretty good. We've got our abstract functions. The only thing that I would add, because we want to control the debug data. And so remember, one of the override ones we'll have is our get debug data internal. So we want to have that. Now with that, I want to only output stuff if it is selected. So if it is not selected, then I'm going to just return. Otherwise, we tell our linked state machine to gather some debug data. And that's basically it for the key sort of structures there for the action and everything. Now, 
we don't have any concrete implementations of the classes yet, so we can't see a lot of the stuff in operation, uh, but we do have a bunch of the sort of key infrastructure working there now. So the final little bit that I'm going to do, just because I would like to be able to visualize a little bit of what's actually sort of happening here, uh, I'm going to take my state machine test scene and I'm going to create a very, very basic test scene. Now, this test scene is not going to fully run through all of the behaviors, anything like of that. So this is going to be bare bones go demo scene. So whereas these had that test wrapper, what I will do is I am going to set up a very, very, very basic skeleton for the gope brain. So we're going to create a C sharp script here. This is going to be our go brain base. And it's going to be an abstract class. It will be a mono behavior. Uh, it will implement I go brain. And we'll get rid of start and so forth for now. So there's going to be a lot of different pieces we'll set up in this. I want to focus on this more in a standalone video, but a couple of key essential things that we can set up so we can start to sort of see little bits of it uh, in the debugger. So this is going to have a blackboard like that. Now in start, which we'll actually bring back, we are going to set up here and say, well, linked blackboard, I want to get the blackboard manager and I want to get an individual blackboard for this. Now with the blackboard manager, we don't currently have an interface for that. So if I go to the blackboard manager, then what I will do is I'm going to set up a couple of helper functions here just to make it a little bit easier for us being able to access some of these things uh, because it would be really kind of handy to just be able to directly get uh, a blackboard from this. I like to try and have uh, cleaner interfaces where we actually can. So we will duplicate this interface and we'll make this public static and what we will say is if instance is null we return null uh, this will be our we'll turn that away from being public uh, and this will be an internal function Then just return instance, get individual blackboard internal like that. And we're going to do the exact same thing with this one. So it loses being public. We get a public static function. And we do the exact same logic. If instance is null, we return null, otherwise we return instance and we do the get shared blackboard. So now our brain can get an individual blackboard like that, which is good. Uh, so that's a handy thing to make sure we've got supported. Now there's going to be a few things we need to have implemented. So that's trying to access current blackboard. Uh, so we'll change this around a little bit to it will be a get and a private set like that. 
Uh, that will change to cached blackboard. So current blackboard, like that. And the get debuggable op content, bring that down here. Uh, display name, we can get that implemented. Uh, so the display name one in terms of what it's actually doing, it's not too much to it. We just want to uh, display out the actual game object name. So this would map to our game object name like that. That's going to uh, work quite nicely for us. So okay, we've got start run, that'll link up the current blackboard. Now there's going to be a bunch of keys that we want to initially populate into this. So we'll start sort of seeing how the actual name system works. So initially all I want to sort of populate into this is, and if we go to, we've got a couple of common scripts. This is one where we can be setting names. That's specific for the goat one though. I actually want to go a level up to our general common one. Uh, and we're going to be using that for setting up the names. The reason being is that these are names that uh, a lot of particular things could actually be making use of. So it's handy to sort of have a whole bunch of ones set up. So our common core, we've already got sort of self in there. Uh, the other things that I'm going to initially sort of set up uh, is again, another public static read only. Uh, this one is going to be current location. And that's going to be a new one. And it's going to be self dot transform dot position. So we'll have that. We might also set up one for a move to location. So if we're actually doing any movement, so we'll have a navigation. That move to location. There'll be other ones that we want to look at setting up as well. The other thing I'll do here, because it's a really handy thing to have, is I'm going to create a class for constants. And I'm going to define a couple of ones for invalid values. So I want to define an invalid vector three. So an invalid vector three position is going to be a new, and we can just pass in float.max value for each of the particular ones. This gives us something that it's an easy way to know if it's an invalid position. We could set up a similar thing for a vector two in case we want that. Uh, so a vector two version, pretty straightforward. We just remove one of the entries here. So that's good. We just rename that to a vector two. So it gives us a couple of handy little constants. What I would do in the base setup then for the brain is I do a little bit of configuring of the actual uh, logic in terms of configuring sort of the blackboard stuff. So what I could do is in start here, go and say, okay, well, current blackboard and we want to set. Now, this is where I would actually use sort of the full name for this. Uh, so names and we have self. And that gets assigned to our game object. We could initialize our current location. So we could set, again, common core, names, and our current location. That's going to be our transform position. And we also have our move to location, so we might as well populate that. 
So I just want to have a little bit of data in there uh, so that we can more easily sort of see what's going on. Uh, so I move to location. Well, this is where our common core and we'll have our constants and our invalid vector three position. So that's good. A little bit of stuff for configuring the blackboard. There will be other things that we do go and set up with this, but for now that gives us sort of some core essentials there for it. Uh, and we can set up then just a little bit of things with the actual debugging interface. Uh, so in terms of with the debugging interface, we've got our general debug display name function here. Now we need to implement this. So what I would be saying is if it is not selected, then I'm just going to return. So we don't want to show data for something that isn't selected. Otherwise, what I will do is the linked blackboard, sorry, our current blackboard, I want to be able to get the debug data from it. So I'm going to be able to go gather debug data in debugger and that we're selected. Now this case, I will actually always provide true through to that, but can see that that's not working. And that's because we haven't actually in our blackboard given it support for the debuggable thing. So we're going to go here and we're going to say that our blackboard has to implement iDebuggable, which what that means is there's a couple of interfaces we have to then set up. So our display name, well, that's an easy one. Display name is just going to be blackboard, like that. And then we'll have wherever it has gone. It's going to be easiest to find it from this. Our gather debug data. So this is where you know, we have the, the bulk of the logic and the blackboard being able to display that is actually really important. So I'm going to say if it is not selected, then I just return. We don't want to do anything, so that's fine. Otherwise, what we do is we add a section header that's going to just be blackboard. That. So that's good. We're going to push the indent because we want to indent all of the actual values. Uh, we'll have an in debugger pop indent at the end of it. Now I need to get the entries for all of these different types because we've got a lot of different types and we might actually need special handling for some of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that set of ones. It's easiest when I've got multiple things that I need to actually be working with. It makes it just a little bit cleaner and easier for sort of processing the data. So what I will do is like that. Then I want to essentially have this multi-line select. And what I'm going to do is we get rid of the common bits there at the end, uh, get rid of as much as we can at the start, and then we can clean these up in terms of what they're needing to be doing. So what we'll do is we'll make use of generics to have a generic function that processes the data that we can then go and actually sort. So I want to build up from this. The output is going to be a list of strings, and this is going to be the debug entries like that. So what I want to be able to say for each of these is generate or uh, I think, yeah, uh, generate debug entries or debug entry strings. We give it the particular data set that it's coming from. And what we do is we also give it this 
list that we have populated. So what that actual thing is going to look like is we're going to have fairly standard sort of setup for it. So we'll have generate debug entry strings. We're saying that that is templated. Well, sorry, that it's a generic, so used to saying templated. Uh, that is going to have uh, as its input a dictionary like that. That is our in debug entries. Uh, then it is also going to have a list of strings. Uh, so this is our data set, I would actually refer to that as. So this is our in data set. And this is our in out debug entries. So that looks good. So couple of things with this, what I would be doing uh, is this here would actually be the blackboard key type. So that's going to work nicely for that. So that looks all good so far. So it's going to gather the debug data, provides those uh, dictionaries there, uh, and can handle the different ones. That would change to being T. So for most ones, how this is going to work is going to be pretty similar, but we do want to do some specializations for things like game objects, uh, for other ones like of that, it's handy for us to actually provide a customization. Now there's a bunch of formatting I'm going to be doing, so I will actually define a couple of little helpers for us. So I'll have a debug entry key prefix, which that's going to be color is equal to yellow. This will just make it a little bit easier if we wanted to uh, modify this at a later point. We also have a key suffix for that. And unsurprisingly, that is going to close off the color tag. So then what we would do is for each of our key value pair in that uh, data set, what I am going to do is check if that particular value is not null. So if AVP value is not equal to null, then our in out debug entries, we're going to add. Now the string we add here, we want to put in our prefix. We're going to also put in our suffix. So first thing we would do is the prefix, then we would do our kvp key, then we would do the suffix, we would do colon, and then the value. So that gives us a little bit of a cleaner sort of setup for it. So kvp dot value. So that's good. Now if it was null, then we still want to output stuff. We want to output it a little bit differently. So what I will actually do is actually say here null. This lets us control if we wanted to uh, make the formatting look a little bit different for null entries as well. So broadly, this will work for a lot of our particular ones, but there are ones that it's useful to actually override this for. Uh, so the main ones that I would override this behavior for, uh, one would be for game objects. So to do that, I get rid of the T, and I change this to game object. Now, if it's null, that's still fine, but the reason I'm doing this is because we might want to do something specific 
for a game object. So while we don't necessarily have to, I think it's useful just to already have pre-baked in entry points for the game object uh, and for mono behavior. Just lets us, if we do want to customize it, specifically indicate that. So I think that's a useful thing to be doing there. The other one that I actually want to do this for is, and this is because an invalid vector three is actually going to be gigantic. So if the value is not equal to uh, common core constants invalid vector three position, then we just output it. So works as normal. Otherwise, what we can do is we can just put invalid. So we could do this with other ones as well if we needed to. So that'll generate the debug entries. So we've put those all into uh, this list of strings. And the reason I've done that is because then we can go debug entries dot sort. And then I just add those in. Uh, so I don't even need the braces, because what I would do is in debugger, and I would append or add a uh, text line, and that's just going to be the debug entry. So by sorting it, it makes it that stuff appears out nice and clearly. There's other ways that I could go about doing this, but sorting it keeps it nice and clean and neat for being able to access it. So that should mean we've currently got no errors which is good. Uh, so we are in the wrong scene. So we actually want to be switching over to our bare bones gope scene. Uh, and this one we'll delete the wrappers from. Uh, so this will be gope brain one. And we'll have gop brain 2. Now we do need our blackboard manager in here as well. Uh, so that's something where we want to make sure we've got a uh, prefab of that that we can bring in. Uh, which, if we go to our scenes, I can't remember if we already have a prefab for it. Uh, we do. And that is under Framework Essentials, which is not really a great location for that to be. So I'm going to move that over to the Blackboard folder. Uh, just makes it a little bit more clear of sort of the purpose of it. So I think that makes more sense for where it should be. Uh, so we will bring in our Blackboard Manager prefab like that. Now I want to set up here a couple of, uh, we'll have a simple goat brain. And what we'll do is we will attach that to these two ones. And then all I'm going to do with that is say that that implements goat brain base. And there's no additional functions, anything like that, we need to implement for it. This will just tell us if the Blackboard side of things is working as well. So it lets us test a little bit more of what we've implemented. So we'll run that. Uh, so it's found those sources, which that actually makes sense, because if we remember what we have to do in our Gope brain is we would need to be saying uh, game debugger register or add source this and then in our on destroy we would need to remove that as a source so it helps us spot things like of that which is good so let's test that again so we can see we've got our blackboard there uh, now we can see that the position is populated, but it's actually done slightly the wrong thing there. 
uh, with what it's output, and that's because for the blackboard, we did slightly mess up here. The key still gets shown when it's null. The text should actually be null. So we'll just fix that up for all of these. So we'll just say null. Same thing for this one, uh, except with this one, we'll change it to invalid uh, and clean up the formatting. So let's run that again. And what we should find is we've got a bit of a cleaner layout for it now. So that's good. It's still outputting the position there. So we might have uh, not updated the right one. Uh, and we didn't, we forgot the very last one here. Fix that up and that changes to invalid. Uh, and that should be in all caps. Good. Test this out. So that's a lot cleaner and neater. We can easily see the key and the value. So that's great. So where we're at now, we have our basic setup for the framework for our actions going, for our goals. We've got a little bit of stuff there for the brain itself and a couple of the supporting infrastructures there in terms of the uh, blackboard and everything. All of those are linked up. So what we'll be able to be looking at next time is we're going to be able to take a look uh, at all of our setup in terms of implementing the core logic of the brain, so the actual planning system itself. Uh, there is quite a lot of logic to that, which is why it's going to be its own standalone video. Uh, so as always, as I've been mentioning with this series, uh, if you want to skip ahead, then absolutely, that's all good to do that. Uh, this is a lengthy series. And really, each individual component, it's if you're wanting to really get an understanding of how it's being built, why it's been built that way, that's what these videos are going to be providing you. Uh, if you're just wanting to jump ahead with the code, completely fine. Uh, and that's going to be something you'll be able to be doing. Uh, and the final version of the project will also be available as well. Uh, so you'll be able to access that. Thanks, folks. Hope you found the video interesting and helpful. Uh, as always, if you've found it interesting and helpful, please do chuck in a like and subscribe. It really helps out. It's really appreciated. Uh, if you're looking for the code for the project, so you will find three links down in the description for that. One is the code as it was at the start of this video. The other is the code as it was at the end of the video. And the other is to the final completed package. So you've got all three of those available there. If you've got any questions, chuck those in a comment below. If you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and there is a link to that in the description as well. But until next time, bye!